Last year is my freshman year, so uh, not completely sure what I'm wanting to do. Um, I'm really enjoying my finance and econ, so I'm trying to major um, in both of those. But yeah, like Coach said, I uh, graduated last year, and SCA was something that kind of was rolling. We kind of had like an athlete Bible study thing going my freshman year. Uh, we'd meet in the mornings with Coach Mack. Um, and never really, excuse me, never really got off the ground too much. We kind of did a little bit of soccer in the junior year. And uh, really last year was kind of the main, um, I don't know, the main, I guess you could say, pivotal point for that, in which we like really prayed about it and like, hey, we're going to make this a thing. We're going to take it from uh, what we are now and who we are now as a group, and we want to spread this into Fairview, and we want to bring God's light into Boulder County. And as you guys know, it's a very um, untouched place, and that's why they're all very close to people in that aspect. So um, this is amazing. This blows my mind. Um, this point last year, I think it was like me, coach, and maybe like one or two other kids and whoever could uh, slip away sitting in the health room. Um, that, yeah, that's just amazing to me. But yeah, I just want to show you guys a little bit of my testimony this morning. Just talk about um, kind of the power of your life and stuff, being through the processes that you go through and pushing through tough times. Um, just to be completely vulnerable with you guys, tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I really didn't feel challenged here. Um, the past four years at Fairview, to be completely honest, in my faith, that is. Because um, to be honest, I had it good. I had a great family, loved me. Um, my mom cooking that kind of pork every night and uh, every day. Um, she even packed my lunch. I was 18, um, and she still packed my food for me just out of love. I had an awesome family, friends, um, all of you guys, like you people I don't really know, just seeing people's faces that I know. Um, it was comforting. School was great. Um, hiking, outdoors, you know, life was perfect. But I think that's one thing that I found that is scary is when you get comfortable in life, you're not forced to grow. And so the past few months, to be completely honest with you, have been tough for me transitioning into college. And it's not necessarily that I have a hard time meeting people or putting myself out there, but the issue is that I'm gonna completely do some, like new scenario. And you guys will see this, even if you go to see you, excuse me, and you're still surrounded by friends and family, you're still gonna be in a new, situation, you know, Boulder's going to look different when you're sitting, you know, in your dorm at CU. You're going to be exposed to different people and different things. And as bad as high school, you know, may seem and like the things that happen, I can tell you that college stuff goes down a lot harder. And a lot of you guys know that. Um, you know, innocent fun party in terms of people who, you know, end up, I've had people already passed out on the couch who've been drugged and stumbled into our room because they've gotten drugged at fraternities. Um, people who've been cut. My roommate actually got scraped up. He can't, I don't know what happened. He came in with the skin scraped off his arms and knees. So taking care of him. But I, you know, I just want to let you guys know that's a very real thing. And not to grow complacent in your faith because you know, there's challenging times. And I know a lot of you guys have been through very, very tough times. And I think for me, that was a realization is I've never really been through hard times, uh, so to speak. Like I've been through instances in my life that were tough or that I had to push through and trust on God. But I never really had to make it to the point where I had to put my full faith in God um, because I was comfortable. And a lot of you who've been in those situations, whether I don't know, be you know depression or you know issues with parents or um, maybe one moment you're happy, the next you know you feel like your world's crashing down. You don't know why. Um, those are the moments where you lean on God. Um, and the fact, the fact in that though is you know it sounds kind of cliche, but really the power is in the process. So no matter where you're going in life, when you're going through tough times, it's not about the end goal that you're getting to. It's not about looking on top of the mountain and saying, oh, I made it. Really, the where you learn, I think, and where you grow, and what I found in my life and coaching Dale can all tell you this, is that you grow the most when you're stretched. Um, you guys know, I mean, working out, we can sit at the beach and flex all day, but if we don't ever go lift and we don't ever put work, look, you're smiling. You know what I'm talking about. I, I've seen you in California. I, I follow your Instagram. <laughs> But if you're never stretched and you never put forth that effort, you're not going to grow. Uh, plain and simple. So the power really is in the process. I mean, have you, how many of you guys have climbed a 14 or before? Anybody done that? Anybody driven to the top of 14 or like Pikes Peak and those? So you, see, you guys are climbing and you're driving. And driving, when you drive to the top, the view's pretty, right? It looks great. You can look out and see. But when you've been hiking for six hours and you have altitude sickness and your feet are about to fall off and you're out of snacks, and you have no water, that's when you appreciate the view from the top of the mountain. And the view's pretty, but the memories are really made in the hike to get there. And that's where you learn, and that's where you push yourself, and that's where you grow. Um, one of my favorite verses growing up, does anybody have a Bible with them today? 
Anybody bring one? Phone Bibles are good. Can somebody grab Psalm 23 for me? 23rd Psalm? Just let me know whenever you guys pull it up. Um, but yeah, I just want to leave this verse with you guys because this is one of my favorite verses growing up. And it was one of the most well-known verses. But, you know, going through some tough times recently in college, this is something that I've gone back to um, and looked at again. And it's kind of looked... I've seen it in a whole new light. It used to be kind of a comforting thing that I'd say, like, oh, I'm scared about this, or, oh, you know, I'm eight years old, and I'm scared somebody's going to bust in the house, or there's a monster under my bed. I don't know if I should have been scared of that when I was eight. But um, still, I mean, that's instances, and that was something that I'd recite to myself and kind of tell myself um, just out of comfort. Any of you guys have it up yet? Get it. Can you read it for me just through the fourth part? Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are comfort. So the way I used to look at that was God saying, I'm going to lead you beside these still waters and through these green, you know, pal- or, excuse me, valleys and pastures. And I'm going to protect you in those instances where you're scared. But I think the thing that really stuck out to me is I was reading this a few weeks ago. And he never says, hey, you're in this dark valley. I'm going to take you out of this valley and I'm going to put you into the green pasture. And I'm going to put you into my valley and my pasture with my still water. We know that the eternal goal, we're going to get there one day. We know that the darkness here that we see on earth is, is, you know, it's not permanent. It's something that's going to move and fade away one day. And he doesn't say that, hey, right now I'm going to take you out of the hard time or the dark valley that you're going into and put you into, you know, this great place where if you trust in me, everything will be all roses. The valley that he's saying is the valley of evil is the same valley that he's walked, David's walking through when he's writing this. But he's saying that in the darkness and in those valleys of death, actually, the, I was looking at this in the Hebrew, death actually means the darkest place when they say the, the valley of death. So even when you're in the darkest, most scared you're absolutely, I'm, whether it be depression, worry, anxiety, you know, when you're in those places, God's not saying, I'm going to take you out of that, but he said, I'll walk through that with you. And he's going to be in that dark valley, and he's going to lead you behind, or excuse me, beside the still water and to the green pastures um, in that valley. And another thing that I found interesting, too, is David in here is talking about your rod and your staff that comfort me. The interesting thing is, you know, God's portrayed as this good shepherd, and he is, absolutely. And he guides us with a sheep, but a staff... A staff is used to pull a sheep back. I mean, you guys know it is kind of candy cane looking thing with the big noose around the neck. What that was for is if a sheep's running away, the shepherd will grab them and yank them back to where they need to be. And so God is a protector, but sometimes that hurts. You know, sometimes you're in those dark places and you're running into the valley of death, but he's taking that staff and he's yanking them back. And sometimes it hurts. I mean, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it may not be the thing that you want to do, but God's taking it and he's saying, you know, this is the place where I want you to be. If you trust in me, yeah, it might hurt when I yank you back with that staff, but look, I'm going to lead you beside these still waters, and I'm going to bring you to this place where the grass is greener. Um, I don't know. That's just amazing to me because it's the same thing. You know, the power is in the process. It's not about um, looking at the valley and saying how scary the valley is, but hey, I trusted in God, and even when he was pulling on me, and even when times were hard, he showed me the green places in the, in the darkest place in the valley of death. Um, kind of switching into that, you know, that's another thing is we have to look at. You know, another point I wanted to make is the eternal goal. What are we doing long term? Because I think that was another thing is um, when I talk about being comfortable here in Boulder, you know, my faith with God was never challenged like it has been recently. And because of that, I mean, I was still like trying to do best or whatever, um, doing all that, go to church, you know. But I never really take it and say, hey, I'm all in. I don't want to just be comfortable and, and do this because it makes me feel good or whatever. I mean, there's, there's absolutely time. Don't get me wrong. There's time to enjoy things on earth. You know, God gives us family and friends and, you know, awesome hobbies and mountains and stuff like that and blesses us with, um, you know, wealth to an extent even to, to be able to enjoy things. But at the same time, you know, it's the same sense of if you're not stretched, you're not going to grow. And so I think I was almost fooling myself into believing that I have a good now, so why, you know, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but, you know, you know, earth's really good. Like, I enjoy my life now, so why should I even really work to that? And I think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to draw attention to you. Um, yeah. It resonates with a lot of people who are in situations as good as we are. Because we have it so good. I mean, you hear you're in the top 1% of the world, but you're in like a fraction of a hundredth of a percent 
of how good people in the world have it. I mean, there's billions of people who don't even know where their next meal's from, coming from. Um, they don't have clothes to put on their back, and it's easy for us to sit here and say, and say, oh, you know, that stinks, I sympathize, I wish I could change that. But our lives are so good that we don't really have any drive to look at that and say, oh, you know, that's, I need to change that or something. And these people are living towards the end goal. I mean, I think that's why, you know, we almost cheat ourselves into saying that, you know, heaven's not too much greater than earth. You know, I know it'll be better, I know it'll be perfect, but, you know, earth's pretty good, so, like, I'm not going to waste my time and cheat myself pleasure for, you know, five seconds on earth or something like that when I have, you know, eternity. Like, yeah, maybe I won't have as good as heaven, but, you know, I'm going to have fun here right now on earth. And I think that's the biggest lie that we can tell ourselves, is cheating ourselves into that. And I think that's one thing, you know, I think about, like, my great-grandparents, and, uh, you know, I'm coaching, I'm sure, you know, your grandparents or great-grandparents or whatever, or, you know, they always talked about heaven. They're like, oh, I'm ready to go. You know, we're talking about, I don't, you know, I don't really want to die today, to be honest with you. But they're like, hey, you know, take me. Like, I'm done. Like, please. <laughs> you know, old, you know, a lot of old people get, you know, they're like, oh, I'm ready to go. And to be honest with you, I mean, that's probably because they see, you know, a lot of them maybe didn't have the greatest lives. And to them, the end goal and what they're going to see in heaven is going to be so much better. I mean, they're not, no more walking, you know, bundling up and walking 50 yards back out of their house to go to an outhouse or something, you know. They were living in a place where, in times, where, you know, a lot of them didn't really have it as good, and so they saw that being so much greater. And one of the interesting things, uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, I think he's someone who's such an inspiration because he walked through some of the darkest valleys and those places of death, um, spreading God's gospel, and he still is to this day, other than Jesus, I believe, one of the most impactful people um, who ever, I mean, he literally took Christianity and he took the gospel and he spread it to the ends of the earth under persecution and he was put in jail. And I'm sure many of you have heard this, but actually he was crucified and hung upside down on a cross because he didn't want to be crucified the way Jesus was. And uh, I don't know, Bibles again? Anybody? <laughs> you guys can pull it out. If not, if not, I can get to it. Um, but it's an interesting verse here. When he's he's in the church in Philippi, and if you guys wouldn't mind looking up, um, I'll kind of talk about it. But Philippians one three through six. Um, but he's he's actually in the prison. Not I'm sorry, not prison in Philippi. He's in the prison in Rome at this point, and he's actually. Um, as a lot of scholars believe that he was on pretty much their equivalent of death row, um, and that he didn't know what was going to happen. He, he actually they actually had Paul chained to a guard twenty four seven, and the guards would take shifts being unchained, so he couldn't move. And Paul, in this, you know, the Philippians chapter, he's, he's writing um, the book of Philippians as a letter. But he's sitting there and saying, you know, hey, this stinks, but I've been able to minister to these guards. I mean, Paul's sitting there, he's talking about, he's pouring into these people. And, you know, I mean, the next guard's probably coming in, and he's like, oh, got to get chained to Paul. I know what I'm going to be here for the next shift at work, you know. And he's talking into him, and he's telling him the good news and the gospel, and he's spreading it through the prison in Rome. Oh, you guys have that? Would you mind reading it? Three through six? You guys get it? I got it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So what he's showing is joy. He's looking at these people who, you know, they're just trying to struggle. They're living life good, and they're just trying to struggle with the aspect of, of trusting in God and following God. He's sitting here in a prison. You're about to walk the green mile, chained to some guard. He doesn't know when he's going to die, and he's rejoicing. He's saying, I'm rejoicing for you. Those people have it so much better than Paul, but he's sitting here, and he's saying, I'm rejoicing, and I'm having joy in this instance. And I think it's amazing. I think if Paul can have joy when he's in the middle in the depths of some dark and nasty uh, prison in Rome while he's chained to some guard awaiting his death, if he can have joy and not only look at his circumstance, but look at the circumstance in others and have joy in that and say, wow, I'm finding joy in the way you guys are living and the way you guys are doing. And that's where I'm finding my fulfillment. I think that's amazing. If Paul can do that, then, hey, I mean, look at how good we have it. We should be able to sit and have joy in every circumstance. He's sitting here in the darkest depths of his, his life, and he, but he's still pressing on towards the end goal. And he's understanding, yeah, these present, these present circumstances, they're one thing, but I know the greater good. And I know what's going to come of this. Um, Hebrews 11, 25 through 26, I've written down. Not really gonna, you know, read it and go through the whole thing, but he, Paul's basically talking again here in this instance. Or I'm sorry, they think it was Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, they're not positive, but it's it's talking about Moses, and uh, a lot of you I'm sure know the story of Moses, but Moses was 
pretty much had become the prince of Egypt. And so at the time, Egypt was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So Moses had absolutely pretty much everything he could ever want. He could have even been in line for um, you know, the crown or Pharaoh. I don't really know how that whole thing worked, whether or not he could have been a Hebrew. But he was in line, actually, or excuse me, he was sitting there in a position where he was in the royal palace. But he took God's people and he led them out of Egypt. And they wandered in the desert for 40 years with nothing and eating on, you know, man and this bread or whatever it was that God was providing them with every day. So Moses, you know, in this instance, Paul or whoever, you know, ended up writing Hebrews together, they're talking about Moses who's this man who took literally some of the greatest wealth in this world and was put up on this pedestal and he threw that all the way to have faith in God and to walk with God um, day in and day out and lead the Israelites um, out of that temptation, or excuse me, not out of the temptation, but out of, out of kind of the pit that they were in the darkness. So I think that's another thing, you know, is the end goal is Moses saw that. Moses saw the end goal. And he saw that, yeah, earth's great, but, you know, look at the eternal gain that I'm going to get. You know, it says that God's creating a new heaven and a new earth. That's where I want to be. That's the part that I want to be. So that's one thing that I've kind of been convicted of living. I had somebody draw this for me the other day. They got up on... I guess a whiteboard, I'm not going to draw on the chalkboard, but the stage or wherever we were, and they basically, oh, it's been a while since I took geometry, um, but they basically drew a line with a dot, and they said, this line is eternity. I don't think eternity is this with me either, um, but it goes on forever and ever. Imagine this line wrapping around this room, going out the door, all the way down Greenbrier, all this. This is eternity. This is how you're going to spend eternity, each of these points. Your life, though, is this little dot. And eternity is so long that if this line went and wrapped around the earth 100, 200, 3,000 times, this dot would still be way too big. That's how long eternity is. But what you do with your life and how you spend your, your time pouring into people, that represents this dot. And what you pour into this dot determines how the rest of that line is going to look like for you. Now, if you believe in God, obviously, you know, we're going to have, the line is going to be a lot better than another place that you can be. But... At the same time, how do you want to spend your time with God? How do you want your heaven and your eternity to be? Because what you put into this dot determines that. So next time, this is one thing that I've thought about, is next time I think about making a bad decision or doing something that you know, I shouldn't be or saying something I shouldn't be, or when I have a chance to, to you know, engage in something or go out and do something crazy with somebody, or to take that moment and administer in them, yeah, maybe the fun thing or the cool thing is to, you know, for me would be to go out and you know, link up and network with all these people, having you know crazy times on a Monday, Tuesday night, um, or any point of the week. But I think, what is my end goal? Yeah, maybe this dot might be fun. Maybe tonight that might be fun. Yeah, there could be repercussions for that in the morning. But even even then, so yeah, maybe it's worth it. You know, yeah, maybe in this life I can get away with that. But the issue is, I have to think long term. This line, how do I want to spend that line? Is this one night or is this one instance of fun or this, this one week of going and like partying at the beach or something with these people? Is that worth spending an entire line living where I could be achieving something greater and I could be closer to God and I could be in this film or excuse me, fulfilling um, you know, what he's called me to be? Because if you fulfill that dot, I can tell you that this, this line is going to be something so much greater than you've ever imagined. So I, please, 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 and this is one thing. I'm struggling with too, so I'm right along with you. Do not grow complacent in your faith. And those of you who don't have that faith yet, man, that's something awesome because I, I'm not telling you it's going to be all rainbows. And that dot might be even harder, and it might make your life harder, but it will be more fulfilling. And this line right here will be the greatest thing that you will ever have. And Paul realized that. He says that I. He, he said that he considered his present suffering nothing. The man who was chained and tortured and was spending this time in death row still enjoyed. He said this is nothing. I don't care. Honestly, I find joy in it because I know that the more I suffer and the more hardships and the more troubles that I go through now, the greater this line is going to be. And he said, he almost has it, you know, he's kind of a funny dude. He kind of scares me in some instances because he's kind of like, bring it on. Like, give me more hardship, please. He actually talks about like death and being still with God. He's like, you know, yeah, but yeah, you know, I want to die and go to God, but also I want to experience more hardships because it's making me stronger in my faith. And that line is going to be greater. So he says, I... He, he thinks that what he's going through is nothing but because he says, I see the greater good, and I see what I want to aspire towards to, and I see the end result, and that's where I want to be. So that's just kind of, I don't know, it's kind of what's been on my heart lately, what I've been struggling with through, um, you know, kind of what I realized in that. And the, 
really the power being in the process of how you live. You know, when you're in those dark valleys, when you're, you know, in places where you don't know where to go, or maybe you're just even complacent, you know, maybe things are great, um, but you're just not really happy. Maybe you just don't really have, like, a complete fulfillment. Um, that's one thing I struggle with, too, is, like, it's not really bad enough where I felt like I ever had to, like, drop on my knees or anything, but I just didn't have the fulfillment. It's like I was kind of, like, going through life, like, you know, I, I knew that this was the thing that was great that I should living, be living for, but I was content and I was happy with where I was, and so it was hard for me to pour into that dot. So that's just, you know, something that I wanted to encourage you guys in. Remember that, you know, the power is in the process of what you do. It's not about um, always the end result, except in this instance, but it's about how you learn and how you struggle through those hardships and what you, what you learn from those and how you grow from the instances when you struggle. And you know, you, you won't always come out on top. Somebody uh, actually told me the other day, <coughs> excuse me, in an econ class, and they were saying, you know, who do you think has it better? Someone who wins a million dollars or someone who makes a million dollars? And somebody said, well, it doesn't matter. They both have a million dollars. Well, the man who has a million dollars, he can blow that in a heartbeat, and that's going to be gone. The man who made the million dollars, he's going to appreciate that so much more. He's going to spend it wisely, and he knows how he made the million. So he can go back and maybe he can repeat it. The man who blew the million, that's gone. It's done. But the man with the million, he can repeat that. And, hey, it may grow to two, four, ten, who knows what. So it's just kind of a thing to keep in mind. You know, I know Coach Dale, Coach JB, they're all here for you. Um, you guys have a great um, network, believe it or not. You know, I'm sure you guys haven't been plugged into a church yet. That's an awesome thing to do. There's people there for you. Um, if you guys want my contact stuff, I can absolutely give that to you. But um, coach and uh, the other coach here, there's no better people to be leading you guys at FCA. And uh, this is awesome. This is incredible. I never thought I'd see this many seats filled, um, especially within a year. So you guys keep it up because it's, it's amazing. So that's good. Cool. Hey, I, I got something real quick. I, I read this this morning. I was fired up. I'm sorry. I don't know when you're on class. I got kind of scared. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm good. Listen, yeah. listen to this. I got to share this with you. You read. Read. You're not scouting. So you read. You read. Yeah. <laughs> what will your eternity look like? Wait a minute. Were you just talking about that? Yes, sir. Wow. Good boy. I haven't talked to you for a while. No, I haven't. Go ahead. What will your eternity look like? What if you learned you were part of an experiment where the next 24 hours would determine the quality of the rest of your life? Everything from the job you hold to the neighborhood and house you live in will be tied to how you navigate a single day. How would you approach those 24 hours? Would you be intentional or would you leave things to chance and hope for the best? This idea might seem far-fetched, but it isn't. In fact, it closely resembles how your choices today will impact your destiny for forever.